the mughal empire chapter 9 in this chapter we shall cover up the sources that is ain akbari taj mahal jama masjid and the red fort and political history and administration of emperor akbar before we proceed let us look into this dynasty which was started by babur succeeded by humayun succeeded by akbar then jahangir shah jahan and aurangzeb the mughal empire was the most prominent empire in the indian history these mughals as you already know were the descendants of chinggis khan and timur this empire founded by babur was established by uh, babur and the great mughal empire lasted for more than 300 years from 1526 common era during this era india made valuable progress in various fields such as politics literature music art architecture administration mathematics and science the great historical monuments like red fort buland darwaza bibi ka maqbara shalimar bagh moti masjid jama masjid and the glorious taj mahal were all built by these mughals unlike other muslim rulers mughals never interfered with the regimes of the indians although they themselves followed the islamic religion they were extremely tolerant towards hindus and people of other religions too let us now look into some of the sources in order to gain much more knowledge about the mughals one such literary source is ain akbari this was authored by abul fazl the minister and one of the nine jewels in the court of akbar it was written in the 16th century and comprises the constitution of akbar or is the third and the final part of a larger document which was known as akbar nama which gives detailed information about the administration and culture during the reign of akbar this book also comprises detailed beliefs and practices of hindus as well as the history of india at that time ain e. akbari is divided into five books first book deals with the imperial household second book deals with the servants of the emperor the military and the civil services third book deals with imperial administration fourth book gives information on hindu philosophy science social customs and literature and the fifth book contains the sayings of akbar next is monuments under the monuments we have the unesco world heritage site that is the taj mahal also one of the seven wonders of the world located in agra on the banks of river yamuna it was built by emperor shah jahan in the memory of his dear wife mumtaz mahal and was inspired by his love for her chief architect for the monument was ustad ahmed lahori and the construction of the monument started in 1631 but took eventually 10 years to complete around 20000 artisans were employed for the construction of the memorial this memorial incorporated both persian and mughal architecture the entire structure of taj mahal is made of pure white marble and the walls are engraved with precious stones this type of ornamentation is called the pietra dura next we have jama masjid this is one of the largest mosques in india its original name is masjid e jahan numa and it was commissioned by emperor shah jahan and was constructed under the watchful eye of his prime minister sadullah khan the construction work took place between 1644 and 1656 and near about 5000 workers were employed for the same the mosque is located in agra and stands right opposite to the taj mahal the monument depicts the indo-islamic and mughal architecture made of red sandstone and marble the mosque has 
three gateways, three domes, four towers, two minarets, whereas each minaret is around 41 meters in height. Every gateway has more than 30 steps, each which lead to the courtyard, and almost 25,000 people can offer prayers in the courtyard at a time. It is one of the last monuments that was built by Shah Jahan. Emperor Shah Jahan also built the Red Fort in Delhi in the 16th century. Built on the river Yamuna, the Red Fort or the Lal Kila derives its name from the red sandstone and marble that was used for constructing the monument. Shah Jahan commissioned the construction of the Red Fort after he decided to shift his capital to Delhi. His capital, Shah Jahanabad, is now called Old Delhi. It was designed and constructed by Chief Architect Ustad Ahmed Lahori again. The artistry has hints of Indian art incorporated in it. The monument has two gateways and massive walls. During Shah Jahan's reign, the outer walls were asymmetrical with a view to the housing the former Salimgarh fort. But his son Aurangzeb fortified it by building an outpost to give it a more circular shape. The western gateway, which is also called Lahori Gate and was used for the emperor's ceremonial purposes. The southern gate was used by the public and it looked very similar to the Lahori Gate. The Red Fort also houses Diwan Yam and Diwan Khas. Diwan Yam was the place where Shah Jahan gave audience to the general public and to hold functions of the state. Diwan Khas was the heavily ornamented hall where the peacock throne was placed. This hall was reserved for the emperor to give audience to the nobles, royals and important dignitaries. The Red Fort has its own historic significance as every year the Prime Minister unfurls the national flag on the 15th August, the Indian Independence Day. He also delivers the Independence Day speech from its ramparts. Since many years, the Red Fort is a famous tourist spot and thousands of visitors throng to see the beauty of the Mughal architecture as well as watch the light and sound show in the evenings. These are the sources through which we get to know about the Mughal Empire. Let us now look a little into one of its famous ruler that is none other than Akbar. Jalaluddin Muhammad Akbar, popularly known as Akbar and literally meaning the great. So Akbar the great is also what he is referred to. So after the death of his father Humayu, Akbar ascended the throne of Delhi at the young age of 13. He expanded the boundaries of Mughal Empire to the far-fetched regions of the subcontinents. The Rajputs who were anticipating overthrowing Mughals from India, had Adil Shah, the nephew of Sher Shah Suri, was determined to restore Afghan rule by capturing the throne of Delhi. Under such circumstances, Akbar ascended the throne with the support of Bairam Khan, who was a loyal general of Humayu and regent of Akbar. Bairam Khan looked after the affairs of administration of the kingdom on Akbar's behalf. Later, he became a trusted and the strongest ally of Akbar. His efforts of securing the Mughal Empire during the Second Battle of Panipat are praiseworthy. Bairam Khan took charge of Mughal government on Akbar's behalf for four years. In the meantime, he conquered Gwalior, Ajmer and Jaipur. In 1560 CE, when Akbar became 18 years old, he took all the charges in his hands and released Bairam Khan from his regency. Now let us look into the conquests of Akbar. In November 1556, the second battle of Panipat was fought between the Mughal forces led by Bairam Khan and Hemchandra Vikramaditya, also known as Hemu, who was the Afghan king. 
Adil Shah's chief minister and military general. 30 years since the first battle between Babur and Ibrahim Lodi was fought, a ferocious second battle of Panipat ensued between the Mughals and the Afghan forces. Akbar and the Mughal army fought bravely and recaptured the throne of Delhi. Hemu got injured on the battlefield and was later beheaded. The second battle of Panipat now rooted the Afghan power in India forever. Akbar, who was an ambitious ruler and immediately set into expanding his empire by conquering the neighboring states, wanted to bring the whole country under his rule. He built a vast empire extending from the Himalayas in the north to river Godavari in the south, the Hind Kush in the west to river Brahmaputra in the east. In 1564, he conquered Gondwana, although he gave it back to the ruler after a few years. Next, he turned towards Gujarat, which was at the time the blooming center of trade. Between 1574 to 76 common era, he captured Bengal, which at that time was the most fertile and the richest region of India. It brought abundant wealth to the Mughal Empire. From 1585 to 95 CE, he brought the northwest frontier territories like Kashmir, Kandahar, Lower Sindh and Eastern Baluchistan under his rule. By 1601, he enlarged his authority in the Deccan by annexing Berar, Khandesh and parts of Ahmednagar and brought them under his submission. Akbar was aware of the superiority of the Rajputs and he realized that he needed them as his ally to be able to expand and rule over his empire. So he formed matrimonial relations with Rajputs, that is, he got married to the princess, daughter of Jaipur, Ambar. There were some Rajputs who were not ready to submit to Mughal rules. Akbar had already seized Ajmer and Nagor, and now he wanted to pierce the heartlands of Rajputs, which was never under the Muslim rule. So he marched towards Chittor, the capital of Mewar. He laid siege on it for four months and eventually captured it after the death of Uday Singh, the head of the Rajput clan. After the success of Chittor, Akbar attacked Rantambur and captured it shortly for a couple of months. By 1570 CE, all Rajputs had submitted to the authority of Akbar and accepted him as their overlord. Rana Pratap, the brave son of Uday Singh, was a brilliant warrior and continued his struggle with the Mughals after the death of his father. He did not accept supremacy of Akbar and clashed swords with the Mughal army in the famous Battle of Haldi Ghati in 1576, in which the Rajputs lost. Rana Pratap never submitted to the Mughals and continued to fight for all his life to regain his ancestral fort Chittor. Even today, Rana Pratap is remembered in Rajasthan for his gallant struggle with the Mughals. Akbar then turned his attention towards Gujarat and Bengal, which connected India to the trading centers of Asia, Africa and Europe through the Arabian Sea and the Bay, Bengal, Bay of Bengal respectively. By 1572, he had defeated rebellious Mirzas and declared himself the lawful sovereign of Gujarat. By 1574, he defeated the Karains, the Karanis of Bengal and annexed Bengal and part of Bihar. Along with Rajput, to gain support of Rajputs, Akbar had adopted some policies. This policy not only helped to end the long-drawn conflict between Rajputs and Mughals, but also made them the backbone of Akbar's vast empire. The policies were that Akbar formed matrimonial alliances with Rajputs to obtain their cooperation and he married Jodhabai, daughter of Raja Bharmal of Ambar. He allowed his Hindu spouses to follow their religion and never compelled them to convert to Islam. He treated his father-in-law, brother-in-laws with respect and honored them with high-ranking positions also called mansabs in his court. He appointed other Rajputs in his court and gave them the posts of confidence and responsibility. In this way, he won their trust and faith. Akbar permitted Rajput rulers to keep their kingdom after their defeat in war. 
he did not annex their kingdom but the rulers were ex- expected to accept akbar as their overlord and pay him the tribute so these were uh, some steps that akbar had taken towards rajput and this is also known to be akbar's rajput policies apart from these policies akbar had introduced some reforms both in the society and in the field of education let us look into the, some social reforms akbar was a visionary and nurtured progressive thought he introduced policies for the betterment of his subjects both muslims and the non muslims so he made widow remarriage to be legal he passed a law where no man could have a second wife unless the first wife was unable to bear children the marriageable age for girls and boys was made 14 and 16 he was against the practice of sati or the burning of the widow on the funeral pyre of a dead husband he made the kotwals responsible keep a check on those who forcibly made widows go sati after the death of akbar emperor jahangir passed a law that if a rich man died without an heir then his assets would be used by the state government for several purposes let us look into some of his educational reforms akbar started many educational reforms for his people too he admired and respected the men of letters as his court played an important role in promoting education works of high literary values were produced in various subjects during his time so what he did under the educational uh, field is he emphasized worldly subjects like mathematics logic history and astronomy he patronized knowledge of different religion and spiritual wisdom imparted by the holy books he changed the earlier educational method where the emphasis was on religious studies he set up a translation department and many scholars were invited from abroad to assist in the work of translation literary works like singhasan battisi the atharva veda the bible the ramayana the mahabharata and the bhagavad gita were translated into the persian language he even translated the babur's memoirs from turkish to persian which is known as babur nama a school of indian hist- historiography was founded and many histories were written by eminent historians the public works department or the suhrayam was responsible for building schools and colleges emperor shah jahan advocated scholarship for deserving students during his reign girls education was also given importance where affluent families could come home and their daughters and those from the middle class families could attend the same school as the boys did akbar's reign was the golden age of mughal empire he was the only muslim secular ruler to have ruled over the diverse culture of india based on his just rule akbar the great had established a very powerful mughal empire let us now look into administrative system of mughals or akbar's administration akbar was a shrewd administrator he made several innovative changes in contemporary administration and governed the vast empire very efficiently his administrative system is considered as outstanding even today he had divided his administration under the centralized government and the provincial government akbar was assisted by a council of ministers he himself selected them and divided the workload he formed departments for the smooth running of government his important officials were chief qazi the highest judicial officer diwane ashraf head of land revenue department diwan head of finance department mir bakshi head of military pay and accounts office khane saman head of imperial household department darogai topkhana head of artillery and mirs mir ars head to look after the petitions under his administration akbar introduced 
mansabdari system the word mansab means office or rank in arabic and a mansabdar was a rank holder in the administration now akbar used this system in both civil as well as military administration mansabdari was the backbone of akbar's administration the system encouraged officers to achieve a higher rank which spanned from 10 being the lowest to 5000 being the highest for nobles the person holding the mansab was called mansabdar almost all the nobles bureaucrats and military officers had mansabs the mansab helped akbar define the post salary and responsibilities for each rank mughal empire was a very vast empire it needed a large strong efficient and disciplined army so to control and train his large army akbar had also carried out some military reforms based on this mansabdari system the mansabdari the military administration was the most difficult and loaded part of akbar's administration he kept a standing army comprising the divisions cavalry and infantry elephants artillery and navy every division had dedicated mansabdars appointed by akbar there were two important mansabs zat and sawar zat defined the post or rank and the salary of the person while the sawar defined the number of cavalry men working under and reporting to him there were 33 ranks of mansabdars every officer was given a rank of mansab with the charge of 10 to 10000 horsemen or soldiers akbar had ultimate authority of appointing dismissing promoting or shifting of mansabdars and their ranks many times he shifted civil mansabdars to military posts and vice versa akbar maintained palace guards royal bodyguards and troop of his trusted men and directly recruited armed soldiers he also adopted the custom of taking roles of soldiers and branding the horses that is dag and chehra mansabdar position was not hereditary if a mansabdar died the post was filled up by someone suitable to fill in the position appointed by the emperor jahangir followed the system laid down by this father bearing some minor changes done while remunerating the jats shah jahan reduced the number of sawars under a noble and aurangzeb drastically increased the number of mansabdars hence creating a shortage of jagirs so this is all about akbar's political history and his administration as per the syllabus thank you